Hello, Carol Taylor Carney here at Pal Lane Arts, and I'm with Mary Sabato, and we're standing in front of her beautiful painting that she is going to be telling us about. Okay, so it's oil on canvas, and um, it's uh, painted in a neoclassical tradition, which is how I was trained. And so this painting um, had several studies. I had to do several studies before I actually got to uh, put the oil on the canvas. So first, um, you know, you set up your uh, subject, whatever it is that you're interested in painting. And then uh, we use what's called a site size method, which is a very meticulous way of drawing the painting to keep it in proportion, to keep all the objects in proportion and lined up with each other. So you would uh, take, you know, it's a charcoal drawing. So uh, charcoal on a drawing board, uh, on paper on a drawing board, and then um, set the easel up next to your subject. If you want it to be the same size as what you see, so hence sight size drawing. But if you would like it to be bigger you, or smaller, you could adjust the easel behind your subject or forward of your subject. So after you get your uh, drawing done, you, uh, you would uh, do a color sketch of it. So that's just on prepared paper. So you would prepare paper with a little gesso and um, do the same thing. Set the paper on a drawing board and put it in the same place that you had the easel before. And just do a really fast oil sketch in color to give you the idea of what actually your finished painting might look like and um, what stands out, what might have to be tweaked a little bit. And also, the nice thing about that is when you get your oil sketch um, to the point where it looks pretty much like what you want to paint, you can then paint a frame onto it, onto your oil sketch, so you have a clue as to what dimensions the painting is actually going to be. And so um, if it's going to be, it might be something not standard, like 17 by 24. So you would get your those kinds of canvas stretchers, and then you stretch your canvas. And uh, the last prep step would be to make what we call a cartoon, which is basically a tracing of the big lines in the drawing and trace those onto your canvas so that it at least gives you like a jump start on where to start painting the objects in your painting. And then you, you, uh, you know, you execute the painting. So when you're painting this, you're painting uh, in real life in situ in yes. this room. Right. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what made you want to paint this specifically? Well, also um, give us the title. <laughs> well, the title is uh, mysteriously enough, uh, rocking chair, uh, interior with rocking chair. So it's an interior. It's not exactly still life, although it does kind of comprise little sketch the life. It's more like a sketch of a room that is just like it, we when we were talking about it, we yeah. said it's almost as if it's a sketch of a room that's just been vacated and still still has all the traces of the human who was there. Well, yeah, somebody just stepped away from here. Yeah, right. Yeah, for whatever reason. And then it looks like, um, you know, like this is a little jewelry box. That's from my grandmother. That's, I mean, it's all mine, but these are things that I've accumulated over the years that have some meaning. And um, I didn't realize until I put it together that I had all these objects that were from ancestors, you might say. The bookcase was made by my godfather. The rocking chair belonged to um, my, my husband's mother, and so did the table. This belonged to my grandmother. So there are a lot of, the library is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Some things are mine. <laughs> but, and the shawl is mine, so that, yeah. So, but, you know, and then I just realized that there were all these things that actually had some personal significance. But I didn't realize it until way after the painting was done that, <laughs> yeah. So, well, would you then say that this is um, a, a piece that one would feel that it memorializes an instant in your life? 
or uh, so like in a, like almost like an assemblage, but like in a painting, you assemble these things that have personal meaning to you. Well, yeah, and and the the instant like after the person has been there, like is kind of typical actually. It's not it's not like a unique. Well, every moment's unique, but it's not as if this is an, his, an historical event. It's just something, it's, it's kind of an everyday thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's um, you know, everyday life. So it connects in both ways. Yeah. It connects to everyday life. It yeah. connects to your personal everyday yeah. life. And so in that way, it's both symbolic and expressive, but because of the way that it's done, it also takes on... Um, that feeling of importance in the right. moment of right. everyday life. It's like everyday life is significant. Yeah. These, these little moments are significant. Well, they I think it's, especially when we talk about like neoclassicism, you're talking about a very like strict school that had all of these things that we now think of as like very like um, elevated. But the truth is, is that some of the stuff that they were doing was trying to capture everyday life right. in a true fashion. And so in a lot of ways, this uh, is a nice historical, especially the neoclassical style, because it is capturing something that is every day, but it's a component that makes up life and it's done realistically. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a venata. So in that way, it connects to this history and art history as well as mm. your own personal history. Right. But I'm going to ask you something about the light in the room. Mm-hmm. Because um, when a lot of times when people are using an academic style, they will tone the canvas in order to produce a certain kind of light, or they will use a white canvas in order to produce another kind of light. So mm-hmm. did you use either a tone canvas or a white canvas? Would you say this is all more a la prima, or would you say this is more like from a grisaille style? Because you talked about charcoal. Well, I mean, I've done grisaille studies just to get the feel of both how to manipulate the oil, Mm -hmm. you know, oil paints, and also to be able to just restrict myself to um, using the oil to evoke a sense of light. Mm-hmm. you know, passing across an object. Yeah. Now, I try to use, and, and the tradition suggests that that we use uh, a northern exposure, a north light, mm-hmm. at least in the northern hemisphere, because it's the most constant light. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and I like to use, I don't do an underpainting. I like to just use the, let the white of the canvas, the gesso on the canvas, help the light. Help push, push because the no matter light. what, the light from the atmosphere goes through the paint. And no matter what, whatever's under there is going to reflect some kind of light back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I my preference is um a more of a sense of airiness or or light on it. Even if it's like there are a lot of dark tones in here, right? You but, have, well, you've yeah. Yeah. and you've you've made a nice negative space at the top to allow our eye to go up into it, right. uh, by which creates some of the airiness. Yeah. When you have a view, what well, we talk about art a lot as a conversation, mm-hmm. um, an interaction between the viewer and the artist. What are you looking for in terms of the conversation? Like, what do you want the viewer to? notice or what's your intention for them to get from your work i want i want in any of my work whether whether it's oil or whether it's um pencil drawing (laughs) i want them to feel a sense of beauty whatever that is Mm -hmm. uh some sense of familiarity with it even if it's something they've never seen before so even if i do a copy of um a drawing of a master if i if i go to a museum and i and i make a copy of of say just a sketch or a drawing of a of a master i i will be doing it because i see some kind of beauty in the line 
Mm -hmm. or even in the sense of color, even if even if it's just a you know pencil monochrome, mm -hmm. there's a sense of color, there's a sense of space, and whatever beauty I see in it, I would hope that when somebody sees the drawing, or even if they see the study for this, I would hope that when they come to this and see it, I would hope that they feel some sense of, um, uh, what would we say, like, uh, some sense of familiarity with, some sense of like it hits home with something in you. So, so, you so feel from, like, like it's a yeah, familiar it your setting, heart. but in a yeah. beautifully presented, so like basically. Well, well, basically it's like, there should be something about the design that draws you to it, like either the line or the total comp or the, the way it's composed. So um, somehow like your eye does go up here first because of the empty space, but there's kind of a diagonal mm -hmm. that goes down here. Yeah. And but there are and there are a lot of there's a lot of roundness in this, mm -hmm. which I prefer. I, I don't consciously. No, that, we all, it, we it all just, have it our, just, yeah, yeah, it we just, all have our thing, yeah. And, and it softens whatever lines and diagonals there are in the composition, the, you know, the, the curves, the arcs in the objects within the composition mm -hmm. help soften that. And that also helps, I think, I think people should be able to recognize what, what is there. Yeah, you know, it should feel even familiar if it's, and strike a yeah. chord because, like, this is a familiar setting that we all have in our lives. Yeah. Like, I think a beautiful assemblage of things with history to you is like when you talk about this, what I feel like, yeah. which is why I like it. I, I I feel like people should get some kind of comfort from what they see, even yeah. even if it's um, even if it's a picture of like a war god or something, I think if the figure is drawn beautifully and if the composition is done beautifully, that people feel some familiarity with it at some primal level. Right. And that gives them, I think, some comfort, maybe not consciously, but subconsciously, I think, some of these, uh, a good design gives people a sense of comfort yeah, yeah. A, a sense of stability somehow. You've yeah. all you've also gone a, a little beyond just the composition giving that kind of comfort. I mean, the colors are very well related, and that helps. Mm -hmm. The light in it is very well related, mm -hmm. and that helps. Um, but you've also placed things in here. Yeah, the personal objects. The personal yeah. objects. There's a, there's a pillow that looks like it's just fallen to the floor. The rocking chair is inviting me to go in. Mm -hmm. I have this, if I'm coming into this room, I have a place to rest. Yeah. To act. A lot of artists don't think about where's that place that the viewer's going to stand <laughs> yeah. to enter the composition. Yeah. You know, and then there's what you did with the composition to make us feel we could go around things and in things. Yeah. Which yeah. also provides that well, kind of hominess and comfort. Yeah, I'm not so sure that um, I would be thinking about all that that analytically when I'm You would be surprised how often we put that, we we hear that, and then yeah. after the fact, a lot of artists will go, I guess I didn't think about that, but now that you're saying it, that is what I did. Yeah. <laughs> well, Because a lot of artists, in, all the planning in the world is great, but there's also an intuitive aspect of it that... Uh, is actually bolstered by the composition. Yeah. Like for you to do that much to pre-plan the composition, if you would have made a wrong stroke in any of those things that you did to prepare for this, it would not it would have shown up in this because you would have not included it. If if the color was a little off, if yeah. the uh, if you had placed an object right here, yeah. that might have gone away. I mean, yeah. why is the pillow here and it didn't fall there? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. So like the, there are all these there's all these little nuanced intuitive steps that artists take along the way that is just natural to their composition process, which I always find fascinating. Which so. means that you walk through life recording all this. Well, here's the thing too, and uh, you know, I talked about the the fact that I was trained in this neoclassical tradition, and that's the technical aspect of it. Yeah. But you're you also train yourself by studying the masters. Yeah who are masters of 
what you're trying to master. Yeah. So, um, and one of the ways to do that really is to look and look and look and look. Yeah. Yeah, like I didn't, and I didn't that, do music school to sing Madonna. Not yeah. that I don't enjoy a good Madonna song, but yeah. I uh, sang Italian art songs. So yeah. yeah. So and the more you look, the more that kind of mm-hmm. um, those kinds of relationships, those visual relationships, they inform your just yeah. you know instill themselves in, in yeah. your psyche. In so, your judgment, yeah. yeah right. So, yeah. And so yeah. you don't know why you don't like this here, but you rather have it here. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's a natural you know, thing. You know, this you is have. wrong and this is right. Yeah. Yeah. So, which I think is and what intuition is. Yeah, it is. And that at some point, though, you do start to analyze. If you get to that point where you're saying, I just don't know. Well, there's that. Yeah. And when you go to the museum mm-hmm. and you're looking at the masters, yeah. you're like, this is a painting that gives me mm-hmm. ideas. Right. That one, okay. <laughs> well, that's how you get your taste and like all that stuff. Right. So. But uh, this is a beautiful painting, and well, thank you. we uh, we, we enjoy showing it. So <laughs> come okay. to Pelling Arts to see Mary Sabato's beautiful painting. What's the title, Mary? It's Interior with a Rocking Chair. Boom. There you go. From until November twentieth.